Thank you for your patience. We're finally ready with our panel. I assure you it was worth the wait. Um, we're talking about international trends today, and we're also trying something new on stage, which is a tasting for you. Um, we are preparing small 5CL samplers of beers. We have four beers for you, and uh, the people who brought them will talk about them a little later on to introduce you to what it is. But first, I would like to introduce my speakers. So could I ask my speakers on stage, please? Everyone. <laughs> it's the only one. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Just come on stage, please. <laughs> All right. So, first thing is the introductory round. So, I'll pass the mic to each one of you, and you just uh, give us a quick introduction to who you are and what you are doing in the world of beer. All right. Should we start with the youngest and the lady? Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Hello. OK, I'm Mikhaela. I'm from Bulgaria. I'm trying to brew small batches of, exper of experimental beers, which is great. I just got my master's degree this year in beer and wine technology. And I, I'm a fan of beer, so I specialize in that. Also, this year I made the first craft beer festival in my hometown and it was a big success. We tried to make people uh, trying new beers, which is strange for Bulgaria because we are lager lovers <laughs> and IOS is not getting along really fast. And I'm a beer lover, as I said, so I'm making tasting sometimes, I'm uh, training bartender at some bars and that's with me. You're youngest and uh, I'm oldest, so I should go last. But uh, uh, my name is Garrett Oliver. I'm the brewmaster for Brooklyn Brewery in New York. Uh, we are among the older of the craft breweries. We started in 1988. Uh, I joined them in 1992, so I am 400 years old. Uh, <laughs> I've been brewing uh, IPA and such since 1989. Um, and so uh, altogether I have about 29 years in the brewing business. I have a couple of books including the Oxford Companion to Beer. Um, and uh, I'm highly opinionated. <laughs> Something to be careful. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Frederick Kamman, and I'm um, the founder of Lowlander Beer, which is a brewery out of Amsterdam. Um, we only started very recently, about two years ago, um, but the idea we have is actually quite old. We try to be inspired by the past of Dutch brewing, which involved using a lot of herbs and spices, uh, something we call botanicals now, and that's what we do. We brew Lowlander Beer, which are all beers brewed with botanicals for extra flavor and character, so we try to kind of bring something a little bit different um, to, to the beer world, uh, but actually something which is actually rooted in the past. Ciao, uh, I'm Alfonso from Italy and uh, I work in uh, bars, restaurants since I was 18. And now I'm the owner of uh, a beer restaurant in Rome and uh, a beer bar in Berlin. I started to work with uh, craft beer uh, six years ago and I hope we can uh, export the Italian craft beer movement uh, here in Germany. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jacob Greer. I'm another uh, non-brewer here on the panel. Um, I work as a, a bartender and a writer, uh, but I'm a bartender who would normally rather drink beer than cocktails. Uh, so I sort of made my way in the industry uh, by doing beer cocktails. Uh, so I wrote a book called Cocktails on Tap, which is all about the history of mixing with beer, uh, and I'll be also presenting some drinks on that later today. So hopefully I'll see you there as well. All right, thank you very much. So next, I think we should introduce the beers that we're going to taste today. Um, the uh, start is going to be a Bulgarian beer. <laughs> 
So, Michaela, tell us something about uh, this session IPA, is that correct? Yes. So, I've brought two beers. The first one is going to be session IPA. It's made in Bulgaria, in Bulgarian brewery. It's the second microbrewery that we have in my country. And this is their first try to make a dry hopped beer. So it's a first try. Don't be very critical. <laughs> We're just getting into that. <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. Um, the second beer, I think, is, uh, is, has world renown. It's the Sriracha Ace. So, Garrett. <laughs> I don't know about world renown. No, nope. <laughs> I love it. Uh, no, I like this beer too, but it's uh, it has uh, some bizarre aromatics. The um, the beer is based on the Belgian saison style, which is a style of beer we've been brewing since uh, the mid '90s. Um, so, if you are familiar with beers like saison Dupont, you will find uh, a similar overall structure to the beer. What's quite different is the uh, is the aromatic which comes from the Sriracha Ace hop variety, which was originally grown in Japan in the 1970s, but only released for sale in the United States in 2008. And uh, we started to brew with it then. Um, the Sriracha Ace is best described as having uh, an, ar uh, an aroma that might remind you of lemon peel and dill. Um, so uh, some people hate it um, because it's very strange. But uh, of the beers that we make, perhaps this is the, uh, the one that more people pick it up immediately, whether they are craft beer drinkers or not, and say, that's weird, but I really like it. So very, very dry and about 7%. Over to Alfonso. The next uh, beer that we have is an Italian beer. Uh, yeah, the, um, the beer we will try today is uh, Porpora from uh, Birificio Lambrate, that is our partner uh, in, uh, in beer at the Beer Bar in Berlin. And uh, Lambrate is one of the oldest uh, microbreweries in Italy. Uh, the Porpora is, uh, a, is, a, is a bock, but it's not a classic bock. It's a little bit uh, darker than a classic bock, and there is a uh, uh, European, a mix of European and uh, American, uh, American hops uh, inside. The Styrian Golding at the Cascade. Because you, have a, uh, you will, you will uh, feel at the beginning the, the sweetness of the caramel and the malt. And uh, at the end, uh, a freshness given by the, by the, by the mix of hops. And the last beer is again Bulgarian. <laughs> yeah, so the second beer is Watch Torque Tropicalia IPA. That's beer made by an English brewer in Holland, De Molen. And the brewery is Gypsy Brewery. It's made with hibiscus, but to balance the acidity from the hibiscus, they also put lactose in that beer. So it's gonna be a sweet beer, it's like milk IPA. And in this beer, there's a huge amount of hops, mainly Galaxy and Citra, and it's also dry hopped. And it's pink, you can recognize it by the color. Um, and of course, Lowlander also has beers, um, but uh, you have a stand. So if you want to come by the Lowlander stand, it's right down that alley to the very end, and you can try their whole variety. Would you like to say something about your beers? Yeah, um, as I just briefly mentioned, what we try to do is, um, is, is brew with botanicals. So all the different beers we have um, pouring at the moment on our stand, which is right there in the corner, are beers um, where we use herbs and spices to flavor them. So ranging from a white ale where we brewed with elderflower, curacao orange, um, chamomile, kind of fruity, flowery, to uh, a porter style, literally on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, um, um, Porter double O, the Dutch way of spelling, and we really try to kind of give a Dutch twist to that beer style by brewing it with licorice root, so not the licorice candy, just to clarify that for certain people, actual, the actual root, all natural, and vanilla. Um, so it gives a lot of kind of added sweetness and a little bit of earthiness. Right. Um, one question, how are the acoustics? Can you guys in the back hear these guys all right? Awesome, okay. Uh, the reason we're introducing these beers beforehand is because we want to focus on the topic that we're talking about, and we don't want to interrupt that constantly by talking about beers. 
If you have any questions concerning the beers that we're serving, we have our beer expert, Matthew. Matthew? Matthew, may I ask you just to show your beautiful face? <laughs> this is Matthew. And Matthew has an... Uh, <laughs> Matthew has a beer info stand right on the other side of this wall. And uh, if you have any questions, if you want to try a beer again that you liked, go to Matthew. He can help you with all of that. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> all right, let's dive into the topic. Um, I think we should start with um, maybe you guys giving us a quick overview of what the beer scene, the brewing scene, in each of your countries looks like. I think you should start with giving us some beer. <laughs> That is deplorable from my side. Deplorable. Okay. Um, well, now that I have the microphone, does anybody else want to lead off? Absolutely. Oh, as, as the old guy, you know, I guess I can start. Um, you know, the modern sort of craft beer movement, you know, which may not mean very much, you know, in a place like Germany, uh, I would say started in the UK with uh, breweries like Bruce's Breweries, David Bruce and his uh, revol revolutionary series of brew pubs in the 1970s. Uh, many Americans were starting to travel around then and uh, myself included uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, fell in love with beer, started to make beer at home, not out of interest in making beer but in order to have it. Fell in love with this and this turned in the United States anyway, you know, into uh, American craft brewing. I think one of the things that maybe best illustrates the tremendous journey that we've been on is that when I started brewing, India Pale Ale IPA was a, a historical British style which no one brewed. Today, uh, not quite 30 years later, it is a modern American style that everybody brews. So we have uh, a real cross-cultural current, I think, uh, going back and forth. In the United States, we take in our influences from all over the world, particularly from Germany, from Belgium, and from the UK. And as Americans do, we, we change them into our own things, or we take leaps off from them. I would say that in, uh, there's a very wide range of beers uh, in the United States, I just came from the Great American Beer Festival not two, get, not two days ago, where we were judging beers in 88 categories. In, uh, the, we sell beers that start at maybe a dollar and a half to uh, over $25 a bottle. Uh, we have a large barrel aging program, over 2,000 barrels uh, full of beer, uh, at oak barrels at the brewery. So I would say that interestingly today, if you're looking to add value to a beer, there are really only four things in the United States that add value beyond regular craft beer. And these are hops, funk, I will call it funk, say Brettanomyces character, acidity, and wood. Um, I throw fruit in with acidity. Uh, but, uh, you know, these of you like are the movements, and I think that Berlin can be particularly proud since uh, uh, the Berliner Weiss style is uh, highly ascendant in the United States along with uh, many, many other sour beers. So, in Bulgaria, we are very young in this craft brewing, and the first craft brewery opened 2014 which is only three years ago. And it opened only because the owners went in the UK, they liked the beers there, and said, oh, in Bulgaria we have only lagers, German one and Czech one, and we want to do some ales. And then the opening of the brewery started, the same year opened, I think, four or five breweries. And today we have around 13 breweries or 15. But the tricky thing in Bulgaria is that we don't actually have the breweries. Most of them are gypsy brewing because the bureaucracy in Bulgaria is huge and it's not easy to open a big facility that is, ma that is making food. But the strange, strange thing in Bulgarian beers is that we're trying to make them drift different. We tried with the IPAs 
but Bulgarians didn't like them that much because they're very bitter. And because we're an agricultural country, we started using what we have. So we have a lot of beers with fruits because we have many fruits like peaches, cherries, sour cherries. Also, we have a lot of herbs. So we have beer with Morsowski tea that is typical only for Bulgaria, with thyme and other herbs. And that herb, and by the way, is uh, usually sold in Germany as Greek mountain tea. That's the same thing as Mursatsky, just as an info. Yes, and the good thing is that we're trying to be different because in the beginning, breweries started brewing the same type, and now they're trying to do some, something different. We're also trying to use some cask for the beer, which is something new for us. No one has did it before. And I think we are trying to cope with the situation, or at least try to make something special. Um, mm -hmm. How is the, the mass market, uh, the industrial beer situation in Bulgaria? Oh, the mass market is pretty much the same. We have the same beer, but in different bottles. We have only lagers, the mass, the mass market. We have one wheat beer, one bog beer, and in winter, we have dark beer. And that's all the diversity that we have from and the mass breweries. that goes for the entire country? Yes. OK. That's <laughs> all. And uh, the funny thing is that the big breweries in Bulgaria are not owned by Bulgarians. They're owned only by big corporations like Morrison Corps or Abbeweimbru or Heineken. So they're making the beers they want to sell and nothing new, nothing special. Yeah, but we want new beers, so we're trying to do them. Let's hope uh, for a little more light from Italy, maybe. <laughs> yeah, at the moment, uh, I think there are more than 700 uh, microbreweries in Italy. And uh, like uh, Mr. Garrett said a few minutes ago, now the production is focused on uh, hoppy beers, IPAs, pale ales, double IBAs. But fortunately, uh, from a couple of years, uh, uh, some breweries started to produce uh, good lagers, good pills. Uh, because, yeah, I, when, when I'm thirsty and I, I enter in, in a bar, the, the, the first beer I want to ask is a, is a lager or a pills. But, I can say also that uh, the, the, the most of the beer that are produced now in Italy are really well done, but 700 at the moment for me is too much because there is not enough space uh, for, uh, yeah, that we have no, we are not a uh, good beer drinker, uh, maybe not at the moment, uh, but uh, I hope uh, the, we will increase in uh, four, four liters per year. Um, but uh, Italy is also the only country in Europe right now that has a legal definition for craft beer, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, well informed about this. I, I heard about that you must be independent uh, and uh, you have you don't have to pasteurize and to filter beer and uh, but I think that at the moment uh, there is no there is not I don't there is a limit I don't know if there is a limit ah to 200,000 hectoliters is the limit but if we want to talk of yeah my, my but <laughs> microbrewery is uh, I think the, the biggest in Italy will produce 10, yeah, 10,100 10, uh, hectoliters. Yeah. And uh, I also think that you have to have a brewery, which I found very interesting about Italy, because that rules out all the gypsies. Uh, no, oh, I, I said 700 because uh, 700 own, uh, in Italy now, own a breweries. Uh, That's quite a lot. Yeah, there are also a lot of, uh, we, we say in Italy beer firm, I don't know if it's correct also in English, but there are a lot of, uh, yeah, gypsy brewer also, uh, yeah, but 700 owns a brewery. 
and this is a big number for Italy, I think. Uh, Jacob, do you have anything to add to what uh, Garrett Oliver said about the US scene? Yeah, well, I, um, I, I agree with everything Garrett said. The, the trends that he pointed out of barrel aging and adding funk uh, are definitely huge. Uh, I will say that living in uh, Portland, Oregon, which is uh, one of the best beer cities in the US, uh, we face exactly the same issues you were talking about in Italy of possibly having too many brewers. So we, uh, we're a pretty small city by US standards, so we have about 600,000 people. And uh, one of our newspapers recently decided to profile every brewery within an hour of downtown Portland. And I think that came out to 116 breweries. So it's now gotten very, very crowded. Uh, but the good thing, that we, the advantage we have in Oregon is uh, I believe if you look on a state by state basis, uh, craft brew is the higher percentage of the market in Oregon than anywhere else in the US. So there's a huge local following. Uh, so it is getting competitive. And if you're, uh, if you're starting a brewery now, uh, the, one of the difficult questions you face is, do you want to be a, a small brewery and a brew pub that basically only serves uh, your own customers and maybe a few tap houses around the state? Or do you want to really try to grow aggressively? And if you're trying to grow, it's getting really hard to find taps and to find placement on shelves. It's become really competitive. Uh, the other odd contrast I see in Portland, because I, when I got into beer, I lived in Washington, D.C. And 10 years ago in Washington, D.C., there was no local beer to speak of. We had a few corporate brew pubs, but the local beer was not very good. And so if you were a beer enthusiast, you were getting beer from elsewhere in the country. So I drank a lot of Brooklyn beers back, uh, back in those days, uh, but also lots of imports. So DC was a, a great uh, place to live if you're into Belgian beer, because we would get all the beers over from Belgium and have awesome Belgian beer bars. Uh, and in, in Portland, it's almost uh, a myopia where people love the local beer so much that it's really hard to get them to buy a Belgian beer or buy a German beer because they really just want the local IPAs and the local things that people are doing. And you could, you could put one of the best beers in the world on tap and charge an absurdly low price for it, and it will just sit there because nobody knows what it is and nobody asks about it. So that's, that's a challenge we face there that, as a big fan of Belgian and German beers, can be a little frustrating. Although, in general, that's not a bad thing. I mean, the locality of beer um, is an important factor uh, to oh, its appeal. Oh, I'm definitely not complaining. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I, can, I can walk to about a dozen breweries from my apartment, so it's nice. a pretty good place to be. <laughs> right, and uh, the Netherlands, or...? Yeah, so um, the Netherlands, I think, is... Uh, well, as, as I think all the other countries mentioned, I think each country has its similarities, but also a lot of differences. I think the backdrop of uh, Holland or the Netherlands in terms of beer is uh, quite different. Um, if you look at it historically, uh, or even up until now, 95% uh, of the volume is basically uh, pills or lager, uh, which was dominated by the big brewers, uh, which exported it very well across the world. Um, and the, the really interesting thing is, which I still notice when I go to a bar on a Friday evening, people walk into a bar and say, oh, please, could I have five beers? Uh, they don't even ask for um, a, a specific beer style. They don't say, could I have five pills or could I have five... IPAs or could I have whatever? No, five so beers. So are you mean and do you give them five different ones? No, no. So people <laughs> walk in and say five beers. They have no idea what they're going to get. No, no idea which brand. They just know they're giving, they, they'd be giving a, a lager-esque beer or pills, um, which they're completely happy with. So that kind of shows the challenge we'll still have in the Netherlands, just put it in perspective, because here you see a lot of interesting things. There's a lot of noise, but actually the majority of consumption in the Netherlands is still um, kind of quite mainstream. Uh, and then traditionally what you had is that a lot of import beers from especially Belgium, Germany, to a certain extent the UK, came across the border, um, something which I call now specialty beers, um, which actually aren't really that special. Uh, they're more special than Pils, granted, but we're talking about Hogard and Elef and, and, and other brands. Um, so that's the kind of backdrop uh, in what's happening in the Netherlands. And then quite recently, let's say 20, last 20 years, and especially the last five years, you see kind of a real kind of interesting revolution starting, which is only even less than 1% of total volume. I think if we would ask Gareth uh, in the US, I think it's more than 14 or 15%. Um, so you I mean it's not even 1% in the Netherlands. That, so we're in a completely different backdrop um, there, but that shows the opportunity for us to, to kind of introduce people to new beers. And I think that's the biggest challenge, I think, for craft, inverted commas, beer, is education. And that's the thing we shouldn't forget. And that's why, of course, why we're here on the stage, is to talk about beer and differences and beer styles and everything else. 
because we need to remember a lot of the people, especially in the Netherlands, 99% don't even really know what an IPA is or might not even have ever tasted it. Well, I, I will push back against one idea, which is that, uh, the, that the new localism is good. I think it's actually quite bad. I think it's uh, what we would say parochial. And uh, if, uh, for example, if we had always had this attitude, there would be no Berliner Weiss in the United States. We would not have hundreds of breweries making Berliner Weiss. This beer would not exist because we would not know what Saison was. Uh, we would never have had our IPA revolution. You know, our entire revolution in craft beer, and I'm not saying that you're saying differently, uh, comes from Europe. It comes from Europe. It comes from us traveling here and being inspired and going and taking it home. And now I think you will have a, uh, you know, a, a generation of brewers who will only know their own beer and their own neighbors, which means, of course, they know nothing. Um, you know, so, you know, the, the, the value to me in, uh, in brewing, when I go around the world, the first thing people ask me is, uh, oh, do you want to taste my American IPA? Now, I'm, of course, polite, and I say yes, but the answer is, of course, I do not want to taste your American IPA. Because what I want to know when I go to Italy is, what are you making that's Italian? When I go to Brazil, I want to know, what are you making that's Brazilian? You know, where is, when people write about your brewery in 100 years, what will they say, that you brewed somebody else's beer? Will that be the question? You know, so uh, I am hoping that what we're having happen in the beer world is we're climbing out of the matrix, you know, and the matrix, if you like, applied to our entire food system in the United States. We had like one cheese and one bread and one beer and one ice cream and one everything. Um, and now through social media and, uh, and, and a lot of differences, you know, we have the re-differentiation you know, of, of beer, but it is not by itself. You know, in our country, it's, uh, uh, it's everything at once. So the beer market is the same trend as in the chocolate market. It's the same trend as in the cocktail market. It's the same trend as natural wines coming back, you know, in the wine world. You know, and I think that it's important for us as brewers to see it as all one thing. You know, we are not special. You know, people want more variety. They want to know more. They want to know where their food comes from you know, and, and, and who makes it. Um, and they want a, a wide world of flavors. And I think that as craft brewers, it's a, we have great opportunities to give that to them. Uh, thank you for that wonderful transition to my next question, which would have been, no, no, I, I have my mic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, which would have been, uh, the United States craft beer scene is quite uh, vital and uh, has a lot of uh, evangelical um, power. And uh, in many countries, I think uh, the, the revolution that we see in the Netherlands or in Germany is by and large inspired by what the Americans have done in the past. And my question would be, especially to those other countries, uh, how do, do, do you differentiate yourself? Um, you're inspired by hoppy beers, IPAs, great. But uh, what about your beers or the beers, the craft beers in your country, um, is different from the American and different from the industrial. How do you give it uh, a, an Italian, a Bulgarian, or a Dutch flavor? The Italians have done great. <laughs> yeah, probably the best country to start in. Sorry, Dirk, I was... <laughs> Can you repeat the question, please? Okay, so uh, what makes the Italian craft beer scene um, distinguishedly Italian? What, what about it is... Uh, how do you differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself from the U.S. scene? Uh, I can... But, mm, you mean something that represents us in... Uh, yeah, I mean the, the Italian craft beer scene, the Bira Artigianale, is not the same as the U.S. Yeah. craft beer scene. So what would you say is characteristic of the Italian? Uh, at the beginning, I think uh, there, there was no identity because we are a wine country, so we don't have uh, a, an Italian style of beer. But at the moment, I can say that a lot of microbreweries are working with uh, terroir, like in the wine. Uh, they're using uh, spices from their land, 
Uh, we have a lot of chestnut beers because we have a lot of chestnut in Italy. Uh, fruit from their lands. Uh, Which kinds of fruits? Uh, uh, we have uh, cherries, uh, peaches, uh, apricot. Uh, it, it How also, about grapes? Huh? Yeah, grape. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, now it's uh, it's like. Uh, it's, it's a fashion to make uh, in Italy the IGA, Italian Grey Pale. But about this, I can say that uh, few of few of these beer uh, are, are really, really interesting and, and good. But there are a lot of breweries that now are working uh, with uh, their terroir. And I think this uh, now is characterizing uh, the Italian craft beer movement. But yeah. Uh, for example, uh, we have also, uh, during the Berlin Beer Week, we have the presence of uh, Walter Loverier. Uh, that is a... He produces also only, only sour beer that are characterized by uh, uh, the fruit of his land. Uh, when... Uh, yeah, uh, when he's... Uh, a good period for cherries, he make a cherry beer. When it's a good period for apricot, he make an apricot beer, and so um, on. Is everyone in the audience familiar with the production of sour beers? Yeah. It, it, uh, it, maybe, it, maybe we should lose a few words. Yeah, about, it's a, yeah. the sour beer is from Belgium. Uh, and uh, the, the sour beer for... Uh, uh, in you, you can also ask the brewers if you want yeah, to. Like. But it, is <laughs> uh, 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 the spontaneous fermentation comes from uh, from Bayotte land, and thanks to a a bacter that that lives in that area. Uh, the base of this beer is called lambic, and uh, with lambic they make uh, framboise beers with uh, uh, with raspberry. Uh, cherry beers uh, uh, and so on and uh, there is also uh, another uh, sour style in Belgium in uh, in the Flemish area uh, yeah the Flemish area we have the big example is is Rodenbach but now uh, you can find a lot of good sour beers not only in uh, in, in Belgium but also in United States uh, in Italy and uh, other Europe countries uh, the the kind of bacter that uh, that make uh, makes the fermentation start is different from the bacter uh, of Pajotteland, but the uh, the process is is, is really similar. Uh, and uh, like the like the main style of uh, of the sour beer of Belgium. In Italy, we are uh, we are using the the fresh fruit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe everyone. Yeah. I think that in the United States, uh, our, our our sour beer culture is as strongly based on Berlin as on uh, uh, maybe more strongly based on Berlin than based on Belgium. Um, we first came to know sour beers mostly from Belgian beers, the Lambiques. But, uh, you know, these were quite esoteric and were not taken up by many people. Uh, but the Berliner Weiss style, uh, especially as brewed by a few people actually outside of Berlin, like uh, Professor Fritz Bream with his 1809 Berliner Weiss, which is spectacular beer, uh, you know, made using old methods, um, was a great inspiration. Now in the United States, we have offshoots of this style, for example, the Florida Vice style, which is now widely what brewed. What is that? Florida Vice is a, uh, is a type of beer that starts with a, uh, uh, a hot side lactic fermentation. Uh, the wort becomes sour. Then you have a normal fermentation. Then you have an addition, usually of citrus uh, uh, peel. But you know, since Florida is well known for growing lots of, uh, uh, lots of fruits very well in a tropical climate, um, often they are based on lime peel, lemon peel, uh, uh, orange peel, uh, uh, but also tropical fruits like mangoes, you know, etc. Using the sour beer as a base. 
One thing I would say uh, is that I think that uh, you know sour beer has a uh, uh, a great future. You know, a few years ago, many people said, "Oh, people will never drink that." I think that they're insane. You know, the thing that people have a difficult time drinking, you know, is bitter things. You know, from the time you're a child, you need to learn how to drink bitter things when you become an adult. Everyone loves acidity. Everybody. From the time they are five years old, they eat sour candies and they drink sour drinks. And the idea that people will not drink sour beer is crazy. The, uh, the, cons the idea, though, is will brewers make sour beers that are actually nice to drink? That's the question. Many people want to make sour beers that feed their own ego, you know, to say, oh, wow, this is the most sour thing that you ever tasted. Well, it doesn't taste good. But if you make something that's well-balanced and delicious and has acidity, I think everyone in the world will drink that, and I think that uh, it has a huge future. And uh, just as a hint to you people, uh, the next talk in line is about Berliner Weisse exclusively. So if you want to learn about uh, sour beer styles, come to the next talk. Uh, you will have only brewers of original Berliner Weisse on stage, with one exception. <laughs> All right, uh, how about uh, Bulgaria? Or do you want to? Yeah. yeah, in Bulgaria, as I said, we have craft brewing for three or four years. So we are not united in one style of beer. Also, in the country, there's an inner battle because there are a lot of foreigners that are brewing beer. So they get the trends from the UK or the US and they produce a, a lot of IPAs or payoffs. They've tried to make a Berliner Weiss, which they called Sufiski Weiss, and the public didn't like it. So in Bulgaria, the sour beers are not a thing at this moment. People just don't want to drink them and don't think they're beers, which is strange, but we don't have the culture for that, which is normal. But the Bulgarian breweries, as I said, are starting to produce more and more beers with what we have, as in Italy. Uh, by the way, Bulgaria is also a winemaking country. We have a lot of wines, a lot of grapes. Italy is buying grapes from Bulgaria. That, that means that we have good grapes. So, but that means that we don't have a style in beer. But we have uh, peach beers, cherry beers, as in Italy, sour cherry. We also use pepper, cinnamon, pumpkin. And I think it's this uh, stage that we are. We're just trying to make the styles that are made abroad and then just see what will stick around in Bulgaria. And after that, we can try to develop our own style. But at this moment, we don't have that. Oh, and also a new thing in Bulgaria is that we're trying to use honey. Because also we had a lot of bees and a lot of honey. But that is not a trend for now. Only two breweries are trying to do that, so... Well, it's... we're talking about international trends, so... Yeah, it's, it's a beginning again. <laughs> I wonder what that is. It's brew dog again. <laughs> Always have to make a splash. <laughs> All right. Well, Thank you, Brewdog, for well. that announcement. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone wants to go to BrewDog real urgently, now's the time. All right, um, the Netherlands. Yeah, I think um, what's actually quite interesting, which we started talking about just to come into one of the previous points about stuff being local versus another dynamic, which I think the right word would be provenance, um, if you agree, hopefully. Um, and I think that's the right thing to do for brewers in a, in, a, in a country. So whether you talk about grapes or whether you talk about local ingredients or honey or whatever you might do, is how can you play and in tap into like something which resonates and comes from your local, regional, national area. Um, give you one example. You mean uh, what we started looking at is uh, um, 
we have a cookie and around the season in November and December there's a huge trend for this speculaas called cookie which is only in the Netherlands probably it's easily translated as a gingerbread gingerbread cookie but has a lot more spices over 15 different spices all sourced from across the world and it's completely linked to the old Dutch uh, trading history where predominantly from the east of uh, east of the world uh, they they came back with nutmeg and cinnamon and cardamom and ginger and you name it. Um, it sounds a bit like speculatios. Well, speculatios, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's probably similar. And that's something uh, we started looking at over a year ago and we're launching it. Actually, it's in the tanks now, so our brewer can't be here today because he's uh, busy uh, sorting out the bottling for next week. Um, but that's something I think, just to give you an example, which is what we all talk about, is how can you how can you make sure that you just don't all brew the same style American IPA, whether it's in Bulgaria, Italy, or in the States, or in the Netherlands for that matter. Uh, of course, you need to uh, brew beers which people want to drink and are well, well balanced, and of course you need to pay the bills for your brewery and sell. Uh, but at the same time, I think if you can do stuff which is interesting for your local audience, uh, but also potentially for export, then I think um, that's the way forward. Well, I can tell you, we started to sell beer in France about four years ago, and there was a big article in the New York Times. It said something like, Brooklyn Brewery comes to France with, uh, I think, aims to seduce. We we're going to seduce the French. And it went on about to talk about how the French market for beer was terribly poor. It was the worst in Europe except for Italy. Um, you know, no American is ever going to be able to sell any beer here. And within uh, uh, about a year and a half, it became our number four market. So I, uh, I have been in the last few weeks in, uh, in Japan. I've been in Korea. I've been in Hong Kong. It's one thing I can tell you, you know, is that uh, everywhere that I go, you see that people, when you find beers that have uh, a nice balance of flavor, you know, they're structured and they have some elegance to them you'll find that people will drink them. You know, I think that uh, you know, many people, including in Germany, they will say, oh, well, people here are very conservative. It's like, well, no one is more conservative than Americans. You know, when it came to beer, we had one kind of beer. This was all we had left, and the beer that we had had no flavor. You know, there's nowhere on earth that people have uh, uh, disposable income where they will not drink things that taste good you know, when people say to themselves, well, I don't think that people here can handle it, this is a function of your own ego. Your ego tells you that you are better than that lady over there with the, uh, you know, slightly blue hair and she's 70 years old and you think she can't handle whatever. You have no idea what she can handle. You know, so instead of talking down to people, you know, we brew the beers that we want to drink we tell people what they taste like and why are they interesting and how you can pair them with dinner. And then we trust them you know, to actually make a decision. And what we find is that it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, in Shanghai, when uh, I first got there, I said, oh, well, they're just starting. Uh, maybe we should just start with some Brooklyn lager and some brown ale, some things that are not. And they all, they all want to know, where are your funky beers? Where are your barrel-aged beers? Where are your sour beers? We keep reading about this stuff. We want it all now. Everybody wants everything now. That, that, that's what we're learning. And by the way, uh, tomorrow we have a talk on French breweries. So if you want to uh, see the, the French brewing art um, as it is right now, come tomorrow. We have a good talk on that. Uh, craft beer from a wine country. Um, all right. Did you want to say something? Get the mic. Um, then I would like to come back to something that Jacob uh, hinted at, um, the challenges of uh, the, the craft beer scene or the beer scene as in general, beer culture, in your respective countries. What do you consider the greatest challenges? So did you say internet challenges or general challenges? Uh, if you want to uh, differentiate between Can the I two, you're welcome. just imagine that you said the word internet? I, <laughs> I may have. Okay. Uh, the biggest challenge, uh, well, there's two. I mean, one I touched on earlier is just competition. We have uh, such a huge growth in breweries in the United States now, and they're all competing for space. And uh, actually, this is uh, one of so my favorite. So a luxury problem. Well, the, it is, but, but it's actually fun for me coming from the, because uh, I mostly work in the spirits industry, and then I, I collaborate with brewers in various ways. 
And one of the projects I did when I worked for uh, Bozzi and Aver from Holland is we created a beer uh, with a brewer in Portland uh, that was specifically designed with Yenever as a pairing. Uh, and we actually had the local newspaper come out to photograph our brew day. And so uh, I showed up to the brew day and just wearing ordinary clothes. And then the brewer from Upright Brewery was wearing another brewery's t-shirt for the photo session when the, the newspaper came in. And I was just imagining what my bosses at, at Bowles would have said if I had showed up to this photo op wearing a Tangare t-shirt. Like, I, w I probably would have been fired if I did that. Whereas in, brewery, in breweries, it's a very friendly uh, environment where craft brewers are all helping each other and uh, helping each other come up. And that's uh, changing. Maybe it's getting a little more tense now. I mean, everybody's still on very good terms. Uh, but people do have to compete at this point. It's not, uh, it's not just now the rising tide lifting all boats. Now these craft brewers are really competing. Uh, and especially with uh, corporate buyouts coming in now, uh, we see a lot of breweries taking on uh, you know, bigger brewers as part owners. And then something I dislike in the US, uh, which I've seen a few times, is actually the, a lot of the big West Coast breweries partially funding their expansions to the East Coast with uh, taxpayer subsidies. So if, if you get big enough, uh, we'll actually have uh, companies will get tax breaks of three, five, even over $10 million uh, to come, say, from Oregon or California out to North Carolina on the East Coast, uh, which I, I feel is really unfair for those breweries who, uh, who live in those states and who have been working their way up to, to now have these subsidized competitors come in. Uh, so that's one thing that uh, in the beer world hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but I find really frustrating. All right. Same question? Did you get that? Challenges. The, the challenges to the Italian beer scene. We, we have a little problem hearing each other on stage because we don't have a monitor that's... <laughs> I think... Uh, but you, you mean... Uh, like uh, the, the Italian craft beer scene? Them? Or beer scene in general? Um, faces some issues, I assume, some challenges? Uh, or is everything just Humpty Dumpty fine? And <laughs> no, no. We have a <laughs> That's actually a good one. We have challenges. No? No. Okay. Then pass it on. OK. We have challenges, a lot of challenges. <laughs> uh, where to start first? It's first, people are used to drinking lagers because we were drinking lagers for 120 years and it's hard just to teach people to drink other beer. They don't want to drink it, it's strange for them and that's bad, but we're gonna overcome that. Other challenges are that it's pretty hard to open a brewery in Bulgaria. First, because of the bureaucracy, and second, because of the corruption. And those things are, uh, are side by side, because you should get your documents, and when you go to the person, he's corrupted. So that's bad. The third thing that we're facing is that we're the poorest country in the, uh, the European Union, and it's hard to make people buy a beer that's that is worth three euro or two euro because they can get a two liters of wagyu for one euro. And you cannot say to them, come on, just buy this beer, it's great, it's three euro. They're gonna say, no, I don't want to buy this because I don't have money. And for now in Bulgaria, the main target to the craft breweries are the IT guys because a lot of uh, companies from the U.S. are coming to Bulgaria and starting offices, so they're hiring IT specialists. So we don't have a lot of market for the craft beers. And I think that are the main challenges. Also, when Bulgarians make beer, we are not that precise. There are people that are just opening breweries just to have breweries. They don't... Uh, make, they are not uh, good with the hygiene or they forgot their recipes or something like that. So we have a lot of problems, but we're trying to clean them up. 
Well, I think in the United States we have a few challenges. One, we have 5,600 breweries. Um, a new brewery opens in the United States every 11 hours. Um, and so uh, we've gone from five breweries just in, uh, you know, in New York City to about 60 or 70 probably today. Um, things grow very quickly. We are developing a culture where everybody just wants the new thing, the new thing, the new thing, uh, regardless of quality. Quality is also a problem because you have so many new entrants. You know, you have a lot of people who never studied anything about brewing science, and they're simply not very good. And so um, it, the problem has become so severe that at uh, the, uh, our national conference, the head of uh, our national you know, craft brewers organization uh, told the brewers to make sure they, uh, you know, they don't mess things up. And mess was not the word that he used. Uh, <laughs> it was quite a bit stronger. And people were shocked to hear him use this sort of language you know, from the stage. But uh, you, know, you have a lot of beers full of diacetyl made by kids you know, who, don't, you know, who are so egotistical that they don't want to work for someone else first and learn their craft. So, you know, my feeling is now, and it always was, is that, uh, you know, uh, quality equals respect for your consumer. You know, the consumer worked hard for their money. Uh, they are paying you. If you call yourself a professional, you know, you should be able to do the thing that you said you were going to do and deliver that beer. Um, you know, the third thing really is, uh, uh, of course, the challenge by the big breweries who are buying craft breweries and then dropping the price so low um, that uh, it becomes difficult to compete. So, for example, in our market, we have Anheuser-Busch selling uh, uh, beers from Goose Island at one half or one third the price of normal craft beer, you know, which is, uh, you know, standard old school, uh, you know, capitalist tactic. Um, but for a lot of bar owners, you know, this can be effective. And when you buy a sour beer brewery and, a, you know, a barrel aging brewery and this brewery, they try to surround you with this super low priced beer. Um, and uh, having found that uh, they, they're not being taken uh, when they make those beers, they try to buy and subvert the culture. Um, I think that they will not in the end be successful, though they will certainly have some successes. And so uh, I, I'd say those are, uh, you know, our main, uh, you know, our main challenges. I've just been informed that we're seriously running out of time. So uh, sorry well, to put this pressure no, on no, you. No, no, it's fine. Quick. It's quite easy. Garrett basically <laughs> took all my points. Now, uh, I think it's, it's, it's all what's been said. I think it's, it's quality, which the, I mean, for me, the point is that you need to make sure when people come new into, let's say, craft beer, having never drunk anything else, and a drink solid is something which is bad quality. For one, you should never have something which is so bad that it's a health risk. But secondly, if it's a bad structured beer, unbalanced or whatever, there's faults in it, some people might never come back. You know what I mean? They think, oh, you know what? I'm going to stick to this weird Dutch lager and just drink that for the rest of my life because I've never enjoyed that one. Um, so that's, I think, one. And the, and the second one, which I mean, I think we need to remind ourselves for, and also me personally, is just that we keep opening our doors because the point remains, even despite all the noise and all the interest, there's still so many people who just don't know what craft beer is or know what a different beer is. So I think that's one of the main challenges that we just keep on telling the story. I mean, it, this is great and all these people here are amazing. But don't forget, there's a whole world in the rest of Berlin, which I mean, we still need to explain the story to what it is and what we do. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, we have only, for me, a, a big, 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 big problem. Because now in Italy, is a, the craft beer is a trend. So I have nothing to do. Uh, I open a craft beer shop or I open a craft brewery. And uh, we, have, yeah, we have a lot of customers that knows what, what is the, the craft beer, but a lot of customers uh, don't know what is. So when they go to a new beer shop and try a new craft beer, maybe bad craft beer, they say, oh no, I don't want craft beer anymore. And they, and they go back to 
industrial beers. Oh, um, a lot of times uh, in Rome, uh, in, in, my, in, my, in my bar, uh, oh, you have only craft beer. You don't have something normal. Is is the is is a? I say, but craft beer could be also a lager. Not. Mm. But let's not forget that craft beer yeah, is also a promise, and we'll find something for you that tastes a lot better than the standard stuff you're used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I forget a major, major problem in Bulgaria. <laughs> sorry, just to say it. Uh, the distribution of the craft beer is very hard in Bulgaria because the big breweries go to the bars that sell beer and make contracts with them just to sell only their beer. And when you sell beer from a big brewery, you get money as a bonus. So the bars just don't want to sell craft beers because they don't get anything from them. And that's a major problem because the, they don't have places to sell their beers. The large so breweries are the banks of uh, the bars. Absolutely, yeah. We yes. have the same problem here. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, I think we, we are a little over time, but uh, thanks anyways. And thanks to my wonderful panel. And uh, now we're going to get off the stage quickly to make room for the next talk. Thank you very much.